Hey guys, I've been busy lately, but I would like to share some recent thoughts I've had regarding the concept of qualia. If you've been watching my videos, you definitely know by now that qualia are not only ontologically subjective, as they are mind-dependent, they are also epistemically subjective, as there is no fact of the matter as to which is which, so there is no correct qualia. I've been engaged in some off-and-on conversations about this very topic with Johan and Rotz, and he's very adamant that they do exist, and that this is known by definition through introspection. However, how is it that we can even get to understand the nature of qualia if they are both ontologically and epistemically subjective? In fact, understanding is a bigger problem in and of itself. First, we have to at least pin them down to some level of objective intelligibility. What's worse is that this problem is just the very tip of a large iceberg. In my second video on consciousness, the 90 minute one, I discussed how the concepts we build influence our phenomenology, and I've discussed this elsewhere. I also talked about how the mind is externalized in the world so that there is a framework of understanding among individuals. But with qualia having the nature that they do, where can the understanding be had? Another problem with the notion of qualia is that it inevitably commits one to a form of private language. Let Wittgenstein explain. Professor Wittgenstein, you can't know this pain. Only I can. Are you sure you know it? You don't doubt you had a pain just then? How could I? But if we can't speak of doubt here, we can't speak of knowledge either. I don't follow. It makes no sense to speak of knowing something in a context where we could not possibly doubt it. Therefore, to say, I know I am in pain is entirely senseless. When you want to know the meaning of a word, don't look inside yourself. Look at the uses of the word in our way of life. Look at how we behave. In his philosophical investigation, Wittgenstein writes, but could we also imagine a language in which a person could write down or give vocal expression to his inner experiences, his feelings, moods, and the rest, for his private use? Well, can't we do so in our ordinary language? But that is not what I mean. The individual words of this language are to refer to only what can be known to the person speaking, to his immediate private sensations, so another person cannot understand the language. How do words refer to sensations? There doesn't seem to be any problem here. Don't we talk about sensations every day and give them names? But how is the connection between the name and the thing named set up? This question is the same as how does a human being learn the meaning of the names of sensations, of the word pain, for example? Here is one possibility. Words are connected with the primitive, the natural expressions of the sensation and used in their place. A child has hurt himself and he cries, and the adults talk to him and teach him exclamations and, later, sentences. They teach the child new pain behavior. So you are saying that the word pain really means crying? On the contrary, the verbal expression of pain replaces crying and does not describe it. For how can I go so far as to try to use language to get between pain and its expression? In what sense are my sensations private? Well, only I can know whether I'm really in pain, the other person can only surmise it. In one way, this is wrong, and in another, nonsense. If we are using the word to know as it is normally used, and how, we, and how else are we to use it, then other people very often know when I'm in pain. Yes, but all the same, not with the certainty with which I know it myself. It can't be said of me at all, except perhaps as, as a joke, that I know I am in pain. What is it supposed to mean, except perhaps that I am in pain? Other people cannot be said to learn of my sensations only from my behavior, for I cannot be said to learn of them. I have them. The truth is, it makes sense to say about other people that they doubt whether I am in pain, but I do not say it about myself. Only you can know if you have had that intention. One might tell someone this when one was explaining the meaning of the word intention to him, for then it means 
that is how we use it. And here, no means that the expression of uncertainty is senseless. He later writes, let us imagine the following case. I want to keep a diary about the recurrence of a certain sensation. To this end, I associate it with the sign S and write this sign in a calendar for every day on which I have the sensation. I will remark, first of all, that a definition of the sign cannot be formulated. But still, I can give myself a kind of ostensive definition. How? Can I point to the sensation? Not in the ordinary sense, but I speak or write the sign down, and at the same time, I concentrate my attention on the sensation, and so, as it were, point to it inwardly. But what is this ceremony for? For that is all it seems to be. A definition surely serves to establish the meaning of a sign. Well, that is done precisely by the concentrating of my attention. For in this way, I impress on myself the connection between the sign and the sensation. But I impress it on myself can only mean this process brings it about that I remember the connection right in the future. But in the present case, I have no criterion of correctness. One would like to say, whatever is going to seem right to me is right. And that only means that here we can't talk about right. In regards to qualia, you are just using the public tools of your language and your society to name them and relate them to other things, that's all. Without the linguistic and conceptualizing tools you have at your disposal, all you have are sensations that you consciously feel but can't identify. And these sensations may be given to lesser or more degrees depending on your age and cognitive capability. There is no way to strictly, privately, relate one sensation to another. Wittgenstein goes on to write, but you will surely admit that there is a difference between pain behavior accompanied by pain and pain behavior without any pain. Admit it? What greater difference could there be? And yet, you again and again reach the conclusion that the sensation itself is a nothing, not at all. It is not a something, but not a nothing either. The conclusion was only that a nothing would serve just as well as a something about which nothing could be said. We have only rejected the grammar which tries to force itself on us here. The paradox disappears if we only make a radical break with the idea that language always functions in one way, always serves the same purpose, to convey thoughts which may be about houses, pains, good and evil, and anything else you please. What this demonstrates is that how the words pain or green work in language is that they function as something much more than mere sensations. The issue of what precisely is a mental state becomes tricky, but one thing is clear. Mental states in and of themselves cannot ground meaning. As I'm making this video, I'm drinking a Gatorade. As I introspect in my experience, I find that there is nothing intrinsic about the taste. The taste is a mere sensation that I have learned to associate with the Gatorade. That's it, for me at least. The sensations are not their own thing. In fact, it would be contradictory to decouple them from a perspective, as many philosophers often do in these sorts of conversations. Here's Ned Block explaining this idea better. And there are two kinds of colorblindness, genetic colorblindness. One kind in which you have erythrolabe in both the normal long wave pigment in both. But another kind of colorblindness, genetically caused colorblindness, is when you have chlorolabe in both. Now, interestingly, it can happen that both kinds of genetic defects occur at once. And then you get erythrolabe in the medium, the normal red long wavelength uh, 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 pigment in, this, um, in these cones and the normal medium wave here. So these are reversed compared to what they, what they are normally. So the normal pigment for here, for, for, for here is actually here, and the normal pigment for here is actually here. Now, 
If these connections are hardwired, the connections between the cones and the channels, then it does seem that if the, and if the opponent activations are the basis of color experience, then somebody who has both kinds of genetic defects at once, which happens one in 14,000 times, can be calculated, although no actual such person has ever been observed, we can calculate that one of 14,000 people is like this, and maybe somebody in this room is an example. We can, so we can um, uh, reason that such a person would have at least approximately normal discrimination abilities, but the way red things look to that person would be the way green things look to um, a normal person, even though they are behaviorally fairly similar. But now, if someone says, the be this, this complaint comes up again, the behavior is the same, does it really make sense to say their experience is systematically different? Again, it really does seem to sound like a broken record. Um, but there is more we can say about it and, and, and try to s see what's going on in this objection. So Wittgenstein, um, in some uh, a work that was only published about 20 years ago, some of his notebooks, he wrote, an, he wrote this a, a lecture in English, and he says, consider this case. Someone says, it's queer, I can't understand it, I see everything red, blue today, and vice versa. We answer, it must look queer. He says, it does, and he goes on to say how cold the glowing coal looks and how warm the clear blue sky. I think, he says, I think we should, under these or similar circumstances, be inclined to say that he saw red what we saw blue. And again, we should say that we know that he means by the words blue and red what we do as he has always used them as we do. So what Wittgenstein is saying, as I understand he's famously difficult to interpret, is that we could have a normal person who says, um, uh, uh, um, so we could have an abnormal person who wakes up and says, okay, red things look green to me. Um, and the normal person could say, red things look red to me and green to you. Um, and this guy could say, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, un I'm unusual that something happened in my brain, or he's like the, the person who had the operation. Um, but what Wittgenstein goes on to say is that this could not always happen. Now, why could it not always happen? Well, the reason, well, at least one reason why it could not always happen is suppose we have two people who are inverted with respect to each other, and suppose they're both normal. We might have normal. Now, the, the, the case of the 1 in 14,000, I said it was a result of two genetic defects. But of course, from his point of view, we're the ones that have the two genetic defects, right? If there were more of his kind than ours, we would be the, uh, the abnormal ones. So just mere numbers doesn't make abnormality. Um, his vision, his color vision is just as good as ours. And we might speculate, in fact, there's some reason to think that people's color vision does differ right a lot, even genetically, one from one person to another. And then if we have two inverted people, if one says red things look red to me and green to you, this one can say, who says you're the one for whom red things look look red and I'm the one who, who, for whom red things look green? Instead, what we should say is that red is a external term that applies to things in the world, but does not apply to our experience. And there's a distinction introduced by Sidney Shoemaker that is uh, um, supposed to give this idea, which is he says, he says, look, suppose we have uh, 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 these uh, two twins um, where um, um, it looks red to both of them, even though one of them is cross-wired. We should say it looks the same in the intentional sense, which just means that their experience ascribes the same external world property to the world. Um, looks the same in the intentional sense, and in the case where one of these twins is seeing green and the other is seeing red, it looks the same in the qualitative sense. So he distinguishes between an intentional and a qualitative sense of looks the same, and that gives rise to a distinction between intentional and qualitative content, which is the, um, uh, the content of, um, of uh, 
uh, uh, the intentional content is the content you ascribe to the world. It looks red. The two, these two people say it looks red. They're ascribing the same, con the same property to the world. So their intentional content is the same, but they're reversed in qualitative content. And a similar idea uh, was uh, endorsed by uh, Gottlob Frege, who said, the word white ordinarily makes us think of a certain sensation, which is, of course, entirely subjective. But even in ordinary everyday speech, it often bears, I think, an objective sense, which is the same as uh, Shoemaker's intentional sense. Um, when we call snow white, we mean to refer to an objective quality, which we recognize in ordinary light by a certain sensation. Often, therefore, a color word does not signify our subjective sensation, which we, he said, he thinks, I don't agree with this, we cannot know to agree with anyone else's, for obviously calling things by the same name does not guarantee as much, but rather an objective quality. And I think he might have gone on to say that even looks white is objective because it means looks to be white in an objective sense. And let's, returning to Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein um, is um, the orthodox interpretation um, of Wittgenstein as he's saying that the, the hypothesis of uh, the existence of qualia and inverted the possibility of ingorded qualia is incoherent or otherwise nonsensical. But there is an unorthodox interpretation of Wittgenstein in which he's agnostic about qualia and really only saying what his real interest is, is the external language game and that language does not and cannot express qualia except in, uh, uh, in very indirect ways, like the qualia I'm having when I see this red thing. Um, he had this famous passage, suppose everyone had a, the so-called beetle in the box passage, suppose everyone had a box with something in it, we call it a beetle. No one can look into anyone else's box and everyone says he knows what a beetle is only by looking at his beetle. Here, it would be quite possible for everyone to have something different in his box. One might even imagine such a thing constantly changing. But suppose the word beetle had a use in these people's language. If so, it would not be used as the name of a thing. The thing in the box has no place in the language game at all, not even as a something, for the box might even be empty. No, one can divide through by the thing in the box. It cancels out whatever it is. So the key passage here, um, is the, um, the thing in the box has no place in the language game um, at all. So I'm taking Wittgenstein to be saying, be agnostic on the question of whether, well, there really is something in the box. Um, uh, and the, uh, namely our, 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 our private quality. 